Hey, what is up, guys? It's your boy Speed here, and today we're gonna be watching how Bakaz gets an 11 minute battle for Yara Nursa. He is rank one. I believe this is in North America. He's rank one. He gets an 11 minute battle fury this game, which is a pretty crazy timing, especially considering, uh, as you see, I guess it's more like 12. Okay, I lied to you guys, sorry. <laughs> he gets a 12 minute battle fury. He only has one kill, right? It's not like he's seven and oh, and he's completely dumpstering. We're gonna talk about how to reliably get a very, very early battle for your timing. So then of course you can transition that into your next set of items. He goes phase boots. After phase boots, he picks up a wind lace. I love casual wind lace. From there, he decides to go, uh, he actually went ogre axe and a blink. I guess the pace of the game kind of switched up and he felt he could get active. I think it was primarily cause he got an Aegis. And so he was like, okay, I can go really crazy with the Aegis. I can play a bit more aggressive. So I think that's why he opted for the blink before completing the BKB. Definitely weird, but that's what he went for. From there into the BKB, after that into MKB. Great MKB game. It deals with the halberd of the Huskar, right? You can basically guarantee that when you jump him, you kill him. You won't miss as much or almost at all. So you'll guarantee that you burst him. He won't be able to get off some clean armlet toggles. And on top of that, Brewmaster has a big mischance problem. Uh, when he puts on his like cinder brew, it's very bizarre. He can get up to like 70% mischance or something. So I love the MKB uh, B purchase this game. I think it's wonderful. Also, I want to tell you guys that if you've been struggling with solo queue and you're looking to get to the next rank, I'm going to be able to help you. Like literally with the Game Leap website, I'm going to give you guys guides that are going to make it unbelievably clear on what you need to do. So if you've been stuck in the solo queue grind, you don't know what to do and you want to become absolutely broken. <laughs> but like actually you want to become much, much better at Dota and you want to take it more seriously, the Game Leap website is going to help you do that. So click the link down below. I'm going to help you get to the next rank and I'll see you there. So in terms of the laning stage, the main thing I want to cover is how to have a more reliable laning stage. I don't want to get, you know, really complex here and talk too much about the matchup. I'm going to do that quick right now, though. So one thing to note right off the bat is he actually lets the wave go under tower and immediately aggros and hits the creep once. So th this seems very, very intentional. It seems extraordinarily intentional. You can't tell me that a rank one player, right? The best player in the region would block on Radiant, right? Every good player knows if you block on Radiant, it's gonna go under your tower unless they blocked as well. But he knew where Brewmaster was. He knew Brewmaster wasn't blocking. So you'll see he hits the creep, aggros, and that allows him because he has that bonus Fury Swipe damage. I guess it wouldn't have mattered in that case, but it allows him to get that CS. From here as well, I think he doesn't get that one. Yeah, he doesn't get that one, but he uses the Fury Swipes, builds them up very quickly to make securing the, uh, the creep much, much easier and gets three creeps in the first wave. Now, I think one reason why he might want to do this, or this is a good option in this lane, is Phoenix is not too great early on. And especially when the birds are down, the fire spirits are down, uh, Phoenix doesn't do much at all. So he pushes in the wave. Then when it's up towards the tower, he immediately pulls aggro. When he pulls aggro, he starts auto attacking the creeps, right? This is very intentional. These are not accidental auto attacks. And the reason why he does this is just so that they can't pressure him very hard. He's typically going to be in a state of creep advantage. Not right now, but the wave will shove in in a moment. So he'll often have more creeps than the enemy, so they can't hit him. And on top of that, he constantly has these fury swipes built up. So it's very easy to last it when you're hitting for, you know, eight more, 16 more, 24 more than you usually would. It makes it obviously incredibly easy to CS. And we'll see, he hits this creep literally four times before it dies. Uh, it doesn't on this one, but yeah, the constant aggro and then the constant auto attacks make it where it's harder for the enemy to pressure him. And this might seem weird. You might be doubting like, Speed, why would he do this? You know, Ursa is a lane dominator. But I would say Ursa is not really a lane dominator until the later levels, right? Ursa is only really good when honestly nowadays I feel like level four is the timing because that's when you have one point in Fury Swipe and one point in Urshock. That's when I really feel like you can close the gap and do the damage. Until then, I don't know. They, I don't think the hero is that strong. Now I love what he does here. So he's going to pull aggro from the opposite side of the Rubik, right? And this is very important to know. You don't want to aggro. Sorry for the replay bugs, guys. I don't know what to tell you about it. It's just so bad right now. <laughs> it's been bugged for months now. This this sticky hero thingy, but whatever. It is what it is. So he pulls aggro from the opposite side of the Rubik, right? To the right side of the lane. And this preps the creeps to be in, in better aggro range or in a better position to be aggroed next time he tries, right? Because they'll be a little bit closer to him. So it'll be slightly easier to try. So he'll go for it again here, right? Pulls aggro away from the Rubik. Then... He'll go for it again here. And you can see this allows him to pull the wave back and prevent the creeps from dying to some extent as well, because you're pulling them away from your melee creeps. So the melee creeps aren't clicking them, right? If the melee creeps have to run and chase the creeps to hit them, they're not necessarily going uh, to die, right? 
So it, it is a good way, especially if the enemy is auto attacking the wave to get it back and get it in a good position. Once again, we'll see him consistently auto attack the creeps at least once to prep, right? Uh, he doesn't do it here because he's completely uncontested. So he's confident enough he can. Comically, he did it for that one. So yeah, very, very easy idea. Very simple idea as he pounces forward. Here, I think he's just understanding that he's pouncing forward on the double wave. It's a clean idea. He tried to get the CS uh, with the Q. Unfortunately, he did miss it here. Bit of a bummer. But he's he's trying to get the CS with the Q. And you can imagine in low Marmar games, if you are able to double up the wave like that and then Q forward when the, the last range creep is about to die, the enemy is often going to overextend by a lot. And that's when you get your big, your big damage, your big punish. They can't mat up in a situation like this. Some lanes can, of course. It's not like this is a guarantee. You know, if the enemy lane is Marcy uh, Viper and you played like this, it might not matter. You know what I mean? Uh, once they're at their spike. So this would still be useful, right? Shoving in the lane is still useful because these constant double waves make it where they just can't pressure him. And so it's it's not necessarily horrible for the Brewmaster by any means. But as I said, this is not a lane he's trying to dominate. He's trying to get to his ring of health so he can't be chipped out by the Rubik Brewmaster lane. Now, level three, this is where things can get a little bit spicy because your Fury Swipe doubles in the damage that you get per attack. It goes from 10 to 19. Oh, I actually got that wrong earlier, my bad. So it nearly doubles, right, from 10 to 19. So it's a huge, huge spike, right? Massive spike in damage. And so you can start to look to put pressure. Of course, he's not necessarily going to want to put pressure on the tower here, right? That would be a bit extreme, a bit too far. So instead, he'll actually just once again pull a little bit of aggro. He doesn't do it here because with the level two Fury Swipes, there's no way he gets denied if he's just decent at last hitting. Um, and yeah, he really plays aggressive using the Fury Swipes to try to get denies under the tower. Pretty crazy. And I really love the Ring of Health rush in this lane. I think it's particularly good this game because the enemy has to chip you down, right? They have to play in a way where they're never going to kill you from full HP. Their heroes just don't do that. It's not like they have some Crystal Maiden Slaughter lane or a Mar Marcy Viper lane, right? Where you would maybe want to consider rushing boots just so you don't get gone on at all. Or, you know, it's harder for them to go on you. But in this lane, it's all a chip lane. Brew is never going to kill you from full HP. He tries to poke you down over time. So building into the Battle Fury and prioritizing the Ring of Health before boots and even before the phase boots makes a lot of sense. And now he can even get aggressive, right? The Brewmaster overcommits for the first time in the lane, right? He really hasn't been going crazy. He's been playing pretty, pretty defensive, right? Very, very defensive, actually. So the, the, the first time he gets aggressive is when Brew slightly, actually not slightly, but pretty hard overcommits for these uh, range creeps here, right? So once again, he's pushing in the wave, seems pretty comfortable with just trading farm. But Brew goes for this range creep here, commits pretty hard, and gets punished big time. And actually, with some good attack moving in between, he gets a kill. I don't know how he got that last auto attack off, but he gets a kill. And now he understands with Brewmaster dead, it's a good time to shove in the lane so that Brewmaster will potentially lose the next wave uh, to the tower. I guess the Phoenix pulled, so that's not what's going to happen here. As he tanks a little bit for the card, but you don't want to tank uh, a full cart uh, worth of tower damage here so he'll just kind of let it die it is what it is the phoenix went for a pull which is which is fine but yeah 45 cs at minute 720 and honestly a large part of that is because he's not over focused on fighting in a lane where it's pretty hard to pressure the brew right it's not like phoenix gives you a lot of kill potential he doesn't the phoenix has practically no disable the q is uh very uh it's a very mediocre slow right the phoenix q how much i think it's like 18 16 percent it's not very good right it's it's no crystal maiden it's no lich so he doesn't he doesn't have to worry as much about killing the brew unless the brew overextends for creep. Same thing here. He'll kind of bait the range creep and go. Now, unfortunately, Rubik's there, so he gets pressured a bit. But with the active of the Seeds of Serenity, some wand charges and Ring of Health, he'll be okay on HP. Now, the next play I think that he addresses really well is this Void Spirit. He just reacts well to it because a lot of players make the wrong decision in this case because he's going to get kicked out in a moment, right? He's about to get ganked by Void Spirit. So Void Spirit shows up. He drops the ulti. He doesn't want to get bursted. Reduces the damage on the Void Spirit ulti there. Uh, and then he goes to his jungle camp here. I thought this was honestly a tad risky in case Void Spirit decided to walk up. But you could see immediately, immediately, when the Void Spirit shows mid, with no hesitation, he actually is going to run back to the bottom side of the map. Right? He's going to run back to the bottom side of the map and farm up this small camp. And I think the reason why he farms a small camp here is he saw that the Brew is a little bit pushing in the wave. But in particular, he's probably a bit afraid of the Brewmaster hitting level 6 when he doesn't have Enrage. Right? He definitely knows that with no Enrage, he's actually able to be solo killed by Brewmaster uh, if the Brewmaster plays it well. And so he makes the decision, okay, it is what it is. I'm against the Brewmaster. I had to use my Enrage uh, against the Void Spirit. So he just takes the long way around, afraid of the Void Spirit gank because Void Spirit isn't showing mid and Tusk was in his jungle. And so he decides to farm this camp, gets a nice stack off, and it's a clean rotation out of the lane. 
And yeah, because he CS so well in the early levels, it doesn't really matter that he gets kicked down a mid. I mean, it's going to hurt his farm a tad. Obviously, best case scenario is he bullies out the Brewmaster and continues to farm in the safe lane. But this is honestly fine too. The Phoenix gets to farm bottom a little bit before getting dove. And at this point, because he's level 8 and has a broadsword and a perseverance, he has enough mana, enough HP sustain to actually take the jungle. And it's really funny, he can test rune here, which it's good. It prevents the Void Spear from getting a DD and full bottle charges, which is actually massive. Like, that's super massive. So, like, contesting a rune like that is a crazy play, as he actually TP safe lane here. So, I think the reason why TP safe lane is he was trying to kill the brew, the brew split was ending. And he also knows that even if he doesn't kill the brew, he'll at least get to farm the lane now, because with the brew ulti down, there's nothing that he has to worry too much about, right? So, he identifies, okay, the threat is out of the way, the problem is out of the way, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Okay, I'll just go farm up, you know, some camps and head back. Oh, he actually looks for, okay, he was considering taking mid fight here, but there it is. 11.33 on the Battle Fury timing, technically headed way earlier on the Courier, and at this point, you know, with the Battle Fury, you can look to jungle and just get efficient in this regard. He is going to clear up the midwave. I think this is a good decision to clear midwave before taking the large camp, and then once again, consider con uh, contesting rune. This was his highest skill play of the game, at least in terms of the early game. This was a nutty play. So his team's going to get dove, right? His Phoenix is going to get dove in a moment here, and he TPs, and because he, he knows the Phoenix is about to hit six. It's so crazy. This is Right, this is his perspective. He knows Phoenix might hit six. Maybe the Phoenix is communicating. It's hard to say. I, I, I don't really know, right? But um, Phoenix is getting dove. He's paying attention if Phoenix might get the egg off because then he can counter kill on the egg. Right, so Phoenix gets off the egg. He can counter kill off of it. Sees that Phoenix hits level six. And because of that, the Phoenix has the confidence to egg and knows it just won't instantly die. And even if it does die, it will be enough to bait in the brew and get a return kill, which is an awesome play. Right? Yes, the egg goes down, but still, you get a return kill on your carry. You're pretty happy about that. You continue to defend the safe lane tower. Overall, it's really nice. And then this, his response to this play was fantastic as well. He's going to get jumped by the Huskar in a moment. So it was a really good play from the Huskar to try to catch him off guard. He recognized that the Ursa would potentially get out of position. So he reacts well, reacts fast, instantly goes in for the Q. The reason why he doesn't drop in Rage right away is he knows that if the Void Spirit closes the gap, there's a chance he'll just eventually die to the Void Spirit jump. So he waits. As the Disarm comes out, uh, he then pops the Enrage. The Dissimilate doesn't do enough damage to kill him, and then the Void Spirit chases. He makes the good decision to hide behind this tree and try to turn because he has no choice. He's not going to be able to run away, so might as well turn and get out the damage. He was then able to dodge the Aether Remnant. I guess it was just a good Q timing to dodge the Aether Remnant. Phoenix tanks it, and he's out of spells. He knew that. He knew the steps were down. Dissimilate was down, so he picks up a massive kill. Unfortunately... <laughs> The Rubik comes in and snipes him up, so what can you do? It is what it is, but really nice set of plays there. 3 and 1 with 86 CS right now is super solid, especially considering he's getting a little bit active here and not just farming creeps. So from there, he heads into the triangle. He cleans up the, a, a triangle rotation. Anytime your offlaner leaves your lane, I'm sorry, their lane, and you can farm triangle into the top side of the map, it's typically going to be a great play. And he keeps it very simple. That's exactly what he does. He's got the Battle Fury, farms two rotations of the triangle on the minute mark. Then from there, he's going to shove out the top wave, knows the next top wave is pushing in in a moment, just based on the clock. 1427 means the wave is right about there. And then he's going to farm up. Actually, no, he doesn't farm up the large camp. He takes this one fight as an opportunity to Roche. That's really high skill as well. He pings it out. His team instantly shifts over, which to be fair, you know, he doesn't need his team to make this play happen. The Weaver bug is very important in this case, but he's able to pick up the Aegis nonetheless. So really heads up play. You can see I didn't even expect them to do that. I was expecting them to just farm the next rotation. Now he'll head back to the triangle and with first Aegis you don't have to overcomplicate the game. Of course you could TP in if the enemy team overextends and dies, but until then it's fine to farm the 30% of the map that's given to you, right? Anytime you can do this as a hard carry, typically you should. It's not, you know, some requirement, but often you should, as he's actually going to TP mid here. Okay, so is he going to look to fight bottom? Looks like he was thinking about contesting the rune. Sees a bit of an overextension, maybe from the brewmaster. Ops to chase the brew, kind of weird because... Does he really think that this kill is worth it? Huh. Okay, they're going for more. Wow, he's still chasing. <laughs> this is, wow, this is wild gameplay. He's getting way more aggressive than I certainly would have gotten. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you guys agree, right? You would have expected him to probably push in the mid wave, right? Kill the nearby camps. Because it didn't look like a situation where he would get that much uh, out of it, right? Maybe a Brewmaster kill at best. Why not farm? The Brew is probably dead anyway. But okay, I guess he just feels like 
maybe the enemy team was going to fight and he could show up to the fight. He's got an Aegis and he can get the tier one bottom. So it ends up being okay. As we're going to see a fight here, this looks like a pretty easy kill onto the Huskar. As they clean him up, Huskar goes down. Good route onto the back line. Uh, he's really waiting for that snowball as he's going to try to take out the Tusk. Great place from Tusk to buy time there. That was insane. And yeah, the blink dagger is definitely him saying, okay, I can get a bit of a faster timing with the blink. Completing blink compared to completing BKB is about a 700 gold difference, if I'm not mistaken. So he actually opts to do that um, and plays around that. As he gets the Brigand's Blade, really great item on Ursa. Uh, just so much damage. He had the Pupil's Gift earlier, but trades it out for a bit more DPS. And then trades it out for an Aquila. I was surprised to see him take Aquila over uh, Brigand's. I really thought he was going to take the Brigand's Blade. It, it feels quite nice on Ursa. It's it's quite the damage item. But we'll see him jump in here, looking for the backline. Pretty risky play, but with the Aegis, it's not too bad, of course. All right, so he's kind of just playing off the Aegis. Does actively use the Enrage to try to finish the kill. Right, He was trying to block the Aether Remnant Stunderation, which he did, just to try to finish off uh, one of the following kills. Now the Huskar goes down, unfortunately. And from there, he looks for the backline, finds the Tusk. Unfortunately, it's a game where all of the heroes have a defensive mechanism, so it's it's a bit hard to just jump and burst. Uh, even here on the Brewmaster, he's going to get thrown up into the air. <laughs> Definitely a very hard, you know, very hard game to get on and stick on top of people, but he's doing a pretty solid job overall. So another play that I love from Picasso's gameplay comes after he finishes off a couple kills here. So they get kited a little bit, but eventually, because of the fact that he has an Aegis, he's able to blink, kill off the Void Spirit. From there, uh, they're going to go on to the Rubik. Rubik has Kuchi, so no kill there. After that, on to the Huskar. He uses the Enrage too. So you can see he's actively enraging aggressively. Obviously, this is largely because he has an Aegis. Otherwise, you can't just click Enrage casually. Typically, you want to use it as a defensive tool unless it's going to enable you to burst the key target. And kind of in that example there, it allowed him to purge the Disarm from Ursa. I'm sorry, the Disarm from... Uh, the Q from Huskar, and that's what he was purging there. So actively purging the Q just to try to finish off the kill. But what I love here, after the fight, after the fight ends, he doesn't linger mid, he doesn't sit around, he's going to run to the top side of the map because he knows I'm playing Ursa, my Aegis is about to end, I don't need to take this useless tier 2. Instead, I can get this double wave here into another wave that's going to complete his BKB really fast, and now the next fight he shows up to, he's going to have a BKB. Very straightforward concept, but very important. If your hero doesn't take buildings very quickly and you're close to a major item, prioritize the major item. That is obviously way better than hitting some tier two tower that you might not even be able to kill. I don't know if it's low or not. It's not that low. So it would largely have been a waste of time because we're gonna see him jump on the Huskar with the BKB. <laughs> I respect that play because, you know, I don't know if he knows if the Huskar is Halberd. It looks like the Halberd was still available. So there's a chance that he doesn't actually kill him because of that. You actually can't enrage off the Halberd. You can only enrage off the Q. It's a very weird matchup in that way, but the BKB guarantees the kill. He takes the Huskar, just trying to amp his net worth a little bit. I respect it. It just instantly kills uh, the core hero. That's going to enable a potential plant to the bottom side of the map, as it seems like he doesn't want to go on the Brewmaster. He knows the Brew has a lot of mischance and an ulti, so it doesn't opt for that. Finds the rig eventually. And you can see he's very hesitant to go on the brew. He knows that the Cinder Brew Brew will just evade the majority of his attacks, so he's very, very, very hesitant to go on him. Instead, he'll take some Ancients, clear up the large camp, get smoked across. Uh, this looks like a let's hate on the Huskar type play, as they're going to find him. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and you can see this game, this game's about done. And yeah, good Battle Fury timing into the Roshan. I mean, everything from Macaws just lines up, right? That's why this guy is rank one, right? It's, it's definitely not a coincidence. His gameplay is just clean. Every decision seems to make sense. His laning stage is brutally consistent. He had like, what, 45 CS at minute seven or something crazy like that, right? I mean, it's it's nuts how consistent he was in the lane. He didn't overforce the lane, right? It's not like he went five and zero. Oh, on the Brewmaster and dumpstered him. A lot of people think, oh, I have to go 1 million and 0 in order to carry my games. It's like you're missing the point. You got to know when you're strong, right? If you don't, that's that's the thing that really makes good Dota players. Not people who are going to pick SF mid and just get 20 kills, solo kills mid. Like, that's not what it takes to gain a Mamar, guys. Like, can you do that? And can you have those games, especially when you have a game leap sub? I mean, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, right? But you don't have to do that. And that's the misconception a lot of people have. It's about clean decision making, clean gameplay. He TP'd bottom to save the Phoenix just based on the egg. Uh, right? He, he was able to solo kill the Brewmaster off one good uh, understanding that the Brew overcommitted on the range creep. He didn't overplay his hand in the safe lane, so his CS was really good. On his battle for your timing, he shifted towards the Ancients after dying. 
right? He took the Ancients because that's the most efficient farm at that point. Took a top rotation because of the fact that his team won a mid fight. He transitioned that into Roche. Things just were very smooth. I'm not going to say they're perfect, but they're extraordinarily smooth. And that's why this guy is a very, very talented player. Now with the MKB, this game is totally done. Enemy team gives up. And yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this carry guide on Picasso Sursa. If you enjoyed and you want more Picasso gameplay, he actually has... Uh, the reason why I was I was like looking through things to look at here. I was looking through games I could check out. So I saw Dota 2 Pro Tracker and um, I was looking through his games and he's owning right now. In his last 15 matches, he's 86% winning, completely popping off. And he's playing like different heroes like crazy, right? You can see he only he has three matches on Morphling, then it's two, one, 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 one. So I was like, oh, there's tons of games I could cover here. And so I might do that. Uh, I really love his gameplay. I think it's very clean, very disciplined. And so yeah, I might make another video here. Uh, or on the website. There's a good chance I'll just make like a, uh, a course to one of these heroes on the website. So consider signing up there. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next one. And I'm out. Peace. And that's all. But remember, before you leave, come on, before you tune out, subscribe to the Game Leap website where we are going to help you get to the next rank. If you're stuck, click the link down below. And I'm out. Peace.